Well, welcome everyone uh, to an evening prayer and conversation with uh, Bishop Sonia, Bishop Charlie and Bishop Peter from the Anglican Diocese of Newcastle. It's great to be reflecting again. Our conversation this evening or whenever you're watching it um, is about um, how um, the transformation project in the Diocese of Newcastle is taking shape and what we might need to do from here. As the conversation unfolds, I think there'll be some moments where we um, scare ourselves a little bit because we talk about some of the raw and um, rough edges of what that is and how it impacts on us. But also there's some uh, beautiful moments will emerge as we talk about the trust in God we see in individuals within the diocese and in our own sense of our journey of growth in faith and uh, trust in God as we've actually tried to chart the paths that we lead. As we talk about the diocese and talk about parishes, um, we know that there's such a mixture and difference. And um, in a sense, like what goes on in our community, no one size fits all in anything we do. There's actually working with the people of God in a particular place to actually discern the mind of Christ, but also trying to work in that way, um, not just with a local congregation, but uh, groups of congregations in the diocese as a whole this deep desire that we might hear what the spirit is saying to the church and might have the courage to pursue it. So welcome again to this gathering that we have. Um, it's actually been a blessing to each of us to, to have these conversations. Uh, we've had a chance to actually see each other physically and face to face, which has been nice. Um, but like everyone in the community, much of our interaction still remains in an electronic way and, uh, um, we're just privileged to be able to do this uh, with you and for you. Bishop Son is going to read to us from Matthew's Gospel, uh, a reading associated with the Ascension, but also associated with the great commission that we all share uh, to be bearers of the good news. At the very end of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, beginning at verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. I have a tremendous privilege of working with Bishop Sonia and Bishop Charlie in my role as diocesan bishop. During COVID-19, we've been spending time coming together by Zoom conversation to think and pray together, especially about the life of the diocese and the things we need to do in our Episcopal ministries. On Thursday when we gathered, our conversation took quite a turn as we began to reflect about the future needs of the diocese. You will hear that in the conversation that we have together. We pray that it might be a challenge and a blessing to you as we all pray together for the life, work and witness of this Diocese of Newcastle in which we're pri privileged to live and work. This comes out of the sort of risk management frameworks that exist. Um, and what, they, what it tries to do is to capture the idea that um, we have an appetite for risk, which is, you know, how much risk we're prepared to take, as opposed to if we don't have enough risk, we're actually not alive enough. And, um, and we know when we're getting close, those are the trigger points, that as an organisation, we have a capacity for risk. So our ability to take risk often exceeds our appetite. Um, and then we have something that's called a risk profile, which is exactly the, the state of our, of our risk. And this particular um, chart tries to um, begin to signal where things are. So um, if our risk profile is too low, then we're actually not being adventurous enough and we may not have, have achieve what it is we're trying to set out to do. Um, and you can imagine that in some places they go, oh, we would start, start a, a youth group and come up with um, 17 different reasons why they wouldn't do it. Um, um, and around it, there's not enough adventurousness uh, in people, even though they might have the capacity to do it. You've got what the optimal state is, which is that um, your actual risk profile 
is well in between your lower trigger and your upper trigger. It's uh, well within your your appetite, and you're sort of you're really doing where you want to be, um, so that uh, you've got enough uh, risk for what you're trying to do. It's not too much risk, so that nothing's under threat. Um, well within your capability and running. Of course, things can go on, which is that um, your risk profile actually exceeds uh, your upper trigger, so you've got some warning lights going on. Then your, your risk profile exceeds your appetite, and then your risk profile can exceed your capacity. As I think about um, our parishes, you know, some of the triggers for us are lack of capacity to um, meet stipend. And that tells us actually that um, uh, we're in a zone uh, where our risk profile, so we're losing money. So therefore we're actually um, being that parish in that place is under threat. Um, there are other sort of indicators as well around, around that, like not doing maintenance on the buildings that we're entrusted with actually means that um, the profile of our risk exceeds our appetite because what we know is that we've got buildings that are actually going to come back and bite us and we can keep on creating those things. Um, in a number of our places, our risk profile I think is beginning to move from objective under threat to lack of viability. That we actually can't keep on doing things in the same way that we have because the sum total of all the risks when we look at you know, sufficient volunteers for governance, sufficient capacity to be able to take up the, min the minimal roles which actually keep a, a parish going, um, the a minimal resourcing to enable um, the buying in of what we call um, a central piece, which is a priest to come in and lead worship, Eucharistic worship, um, you know, the lack of spaces. And we can keep on talking about that in terms of what it is. This sort of analysis keeps on trying to drive us to the point of you just simply can't keep on doing what you're doing. Um, and it's more than corrective action. It's actually around a reframing and a reshaping. Um, you might remember the Alice Mann graph, you know, sort of you get past a certain point and it's not just simply reinvention. It's actually the whole, the whole new thing piece. And I suppose... I'm hearing in our conversation the, the questioning of whether we're at the whole new thing piece or whether we can actually revitalise the existing in such a way that it can actually do what it's designed to do. And that drives me to the question, what's it designed to do? Which is um, that people can gather for worship, nurture, prayer, fellowship, which enables them to live as Christians during the week. And in some expression of living as a Christian during the week, they want to do things collectively, like social justice projects, community outreach progress, projects, education projects, evangelism projects. But some of that living as a Christian in the week is in their own world and in their own sphere. Well, that, that project of why we gather congregations still actually has life, still mm. actually has purpose, mm. still actually has has need and um, you know one of the things that we currently do is say that uh, some of that sometimes well actually currently we say that at times needs to have a priest present to enable the sacramentality and the high level of teaching that's needed into those spaces um, and you know so we can revisit some of that if, ne if needs be um, in some places, but it's really around, you know, what are the essentials of what we need to do that in a way that flourishes? And so I look at some of our places and we've got, you know, uh, let's say we've got four parishes with five buildings or three parishes with about seven buildings across geographic spaces, um, all with pockets of money, all doing various forms of fundraising, all showing high levels of generosity and volunteerism but actually trying to do that in our traditional way we're moving from here you know that the objectives are under threat to actually over here that you know if we introduce into the conversations in most of those places building maintenance and actually doing the maintenance on a regular maintenance plan and keeping it up to date and actually reserving money 
for the next few years of maintenance that we know is coming, you know, like we know the carpet's going to wear out in 10 years. So let's actually put away uh, enough money every year for the next 10 years so that we can buy the new carpet then. That actually would actually make our places topple. So this is a piece that I'm just trying to think through at the moment, which is, is our parish system as we're doing it, beginning to be what um, risk people would say to us, you know, that project is unviable in its current form. So what you need to do is actually become braver in terms of um, uh, uh, setting, setting that up. Does that, does that make sense or is that a bit too scary? Oh, I can see what you're saying. Um, and, um, and I can look at places where I think uh, um, they already know that they're under pressure. They already know that um, they're in the high risk end. And yet there's also some good things happening locally. So how do we, how do we look at a future in which we can try and hold on to that which is good locally, but structure so that that's enabled to happen and won't just fall over? And I think that's more than just cobbling two small parishes together to try and make one. I think it needs reshaping. And I mean, I'm working with that with some parishes and trying to see where that will go. But my concern is mm. that if we do nothing, um, they will just become too weak and people will burn out under the pressure of that. And I suppose one of my, my um, questions in that space is, um, uh, yeah, how do I frame that frame 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 the question? Which is um, those those places filled with good people um, uh, are really invested and have shown great resilience and tenacity mm -hmm. and capacity. Um, um, how do we bravely say, well, we, when we step back from that a couple of meters and look at you and help you look at yourselves, um, it's actually a little bit it's a little bit more pessimistic than you might see because you're putting all of your energy into making it happen. But we don't want that pessimism to destroy the spark, but to actually go, okay, how do we together craft, create and do something that might have a new feel about it or um, it, which doesn't lose sight of what we carry with us, but actually we've actually got to do this in a new way moving forward so that uh, Christian ministry, Anglican identity, um, community impact goes on. And the stress for that, and I don't want to take up all Charlie's speaking space, the stress for that is we're trying to reinvent something we haven't seen before. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a useful way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. What do you think as, I, as we're, we're playing in this space? So I, I think, uh, firstly, I think this analysis pulls me up fairly short because in that, um, you know, upper limit of the possible risk appetite of the upper trigger is a place of uh, there's a place where the good people that Sonia's rightly described who are doing good things locally become there's a paralysis around the the challenges of making provision become too hard mm -hmm. so that is unviable and something has to be released there to actually effectively release the goodness the potential of good ministry in those people mm. and I'm, I'm really concerned about this I, there is a point where everybody just shuts down because there's they don't have a vision of a future that they can live towards. Um, and I think that's where that unviability is as much as the objective unviability. The other thing is I think people, to avoid that emotional space, people really do, as you've said to us before, vastly underestimate the position they're in, uh, in, in some instances, or, or they stick it somewhere else. Um, so people latch on to uh, one part of the problem as the thing that will solve the whole problem and stop doing everything else and, and just focus on that one thing. So that, that's, I think, a challenge to meet in, in this situation. I know that doesn't, that's not meant to sound as grim as it sounds. It's just, it's just 
I, I'm, I'm trying to be really honest about where I, I'm imagining the places I'm thinking about on the on this picture, and they're somewhere between, you know, box four and box five on the right hand side. Yeah, so that's a version of the congregational life cycle that Alice Mann shared with us a few years ago. And she took us through the idea that, you know, new congregations, new activities will be born, grow, find stability, and then go through various phases of decline. And sometimes uh, they will go to the point of death. And recognising that sometimes death is the right place, because what that is, is a celebration of what that ministry was for a period of time and the grace and gifts that it brought into a particular activity. So within a parish, for example, there might be a particular movement or activity that can go through a period of time. Someone's really excited about it. Um, they draw other people into it. It might operate for three to five years really well. Um, and then actually the members begin to sort of withdraw and do other things and then move out, uh, out um, the other way. Um, but it's also true as we keep on going up at different levels. And the sort of conversation they had is... In the early stage, while you're still in stability, there's a cycle of, um, of redefining what goes on, which continues to keep energy in the, in the particular activity. And if you do that, that stability will remain. Uh, sometimes uh, you can actually even start a new period of, a period of growth. So you actually turn it around and it becomes an upward movement. But if you don't do that redefining work early, um, uh, things stagnate and become stale. Then there's the redevelopment phase, which is actually, um, things have gone on a little longer and you actually need to um, actually um, uh, begin again on some things or refresh what's going on with a greater level of um, energy and enthusiasm. And some things might need to change in that, you know, bits cut off, bits added on and all, all the rest. We see it in, with some children's programs. So the children's program worked in that way for a while, then the people have moved away from it. It doesn't engage them in that way. So we change it in a, in, a, in a way. But there are also moments where we actually, the decline has gone on for, uh, for such a period of time that what we actually have to do is give birth to a whole new thing. Um, the reality is that uh, Western Christian expression in mainline traditions like ours have on the whole been in decline for most of the period of time that, um, that we've been in ministry. Uh, Alice Mann reminded us that most of us actually have been trained in the church, which was consistently experienced decline. And so the, the, the question is, in some of our places, are we able to arrest with a redevelopment of some of the things we've done, or are we actually trying to give birth to a whole new thing? And, and that means a greater level of intervention a greater level of um, uh, storytelling. Um, and, you know, in her work, she gives examples of congregations choosing to close and um, gift their resources to other activities. Now, in an urban context, that might be to another church that was actually taking it out. In a rural context, that has some different feel, feels about it. Um, the other thing it's interesting to look in some of our rural congregations, when we actually do decline, the decline isn't necessarily in the number of people who are coming to the churches. Um, they might be about not much different, but the capacity for those communities to meet the cost of those ministries um, has changed. So, um, so at one level, there are indicators of decline. At another level, there aren't indicators of, 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 of decline. Um, and that throws in one of our other dilemmas, which is that we know in our Anglican way that the contribution of stipendary paid leadership um, actually is a critical element um, in, in growth of parishes. Sadly, also, the stipendary paid leadership can also be an element of decline in those parishes. Like if they get it badly wrong, we actually can go back, can't we, and actually hear the stories of the person who mucked it up somewhere back. Um, and in some cases, because of the history of our diocese, um, some of the people who mucked it up, it wasn't a muck up, it was actually criminal behaviour that has actually so eroded public confidence that that's gone on for generations. 
Um, so I'm, I suppose I'm just trying to wrestle with, you know, like some of the mission and visioning work that we're doing rightly is around, can we have a surge of growth or a redefinition um, uh, that, that we're doing? It's uh, the, the question is around whether the level of the intervention that we're needing to do um, will be strong enough or hard enough at this particular point. And that really comes to the heart of the leadership that you and I are needing to exercise, which is, um, you know, is it an intervention to change course or is it a, um, uh, a nurturing that allows the new plants to flourish and we're adding just a little bit of fertilizer and I, um, as I, I spoke to both of you yes it strikes me as I look at that graph and I just think about the people in it in a time of growth birth and growth relationships will be strong because people are focused on the project but when we come down the other side I wonder if just the pressure of decline and the pressure of working so hard and uh, um, not seeing quite the same results might be part of what develops those fractious relationships. So we have people feeling vulnerable um, in that area uh, who we're trying to do change with. So that's um, mm -hmm. pretty sensitive work too, isn't it? Uh, it's highly sensitive work. I think that's a very accurate piece. And um, yeah, because we're, we're, we're touching sacred things in people's lives, mm -hmm. that, you know, because everyone fears these conversations is around whether their building will go or the name of their parish or the relationship with their parish or whether they'll have another rector. So those are some of the things around sacred pieces. Um, then we're touching into their story because some of these people that we're working with have been invested in those places 30, 40, 50 years, haven't they? And they've actually given, and some longer. And... Um, yeah, it's a really around um, those those pieces that it's it's about about the right sensitivity, but also um, being brave enough that the kingdom of God and the mission of Christ isn't held captive to the sensitivities of people who are struggling, and it's actually getting that balance that balance right, which is. Um, it's an art with some science involved with it, isn't it, around actually trying to tease people along in particular ways? One of the insights I've had in this ministry, um, when I look at my time in a parish, is when things are hard, you, you invest a lot more to keep them going. And I think this is probably true for our key lay leaders. Mm -hmm. um, and it becomes really heavily your story. But it's yeah. not, you know, it's not something that you need to take personally, that your community has declined or that church going has changed and so people are working really hard um but it, they're really invested in it personally and how we how we make this journey and help people to see that actually everything they've been doing is, is good um it's not their personal they don't have to take personally the decline of the church i think there's a there's a a clue there perhaps for all of us in that because i, I think i take personally the decline of the church sometimes but if we can depersonalize some pieces of it, um, uh, there, I think that's a useful, a useful reflection around um, you have given of yourself graciously and fully into this space. Um, this, is a, this is a conversation which is about what we are all doing together and, and you're part of it, but it's not, it's, not an, it's, it's not a criticism of you or a negative reflection of you that we now need to do something else. What would that be like in the conversations you've been having, Charlie? There's a strong tension, I think, uh, in people that... So there's the, the, the thing that people articulate about their commitment to the community they've lived in uh, is part of the story that gets named relatively easily and it can be located on a, this has been our church building for this many decades and things. Mm. There's another part in it that uh, I wonder about a lot and struggle to articulate myself. There's a, there's a question of being 
the the investment that Sonia was talking about about putting a lot into uh, leading people in keeping on keeping on in a time when clearly our keeping on is uh, part of a, an ongoing decline is a we're being faithful according to our lights but that does not result in a in in growth at this time so there's an examination that needs to happen of what does faithful living look like for us mm. now and is faithful living for us now um how do we respond faithfully to god's call to us now and trust that the blessing will be in that faithful response somehow mm. Mm. because i think people are terrified of losing what has been life-giving for them at the same time knowing somewhere that the life-giving in it has declined along with their life together and, and I say that as a person who is like you both, just behind, you know, I've lived in a church that's always been in decline. And I've been conscious of that since my late teens. But, I've, and, and as I've become more historically aware, I've realized it's been much longer than I've known about it, that it was happening. But the other thing I'm aware of is that all of that time, new people have come to faith or people have come to faith who in and, and and given themselves wholeheartedly to responding faithfully in in in, in and, and have found themselves grafted into the life of the church they've become baptized and seriously baptized disciples so so this is a puzzle to me uh, that i've struggled to put into words and to name honestly without becoming too anxious, I, I need to own that there is an anxiety in it for me, and without becoming too despondent, but also without being Pollyanna about, oh, well, if we're just faithful, it'll all come out all right in the end. Because, you know, you know so, <laughs> so that's the struggle. And, and I'd like to share that struggle with people I respect. Um, you know, lay people who who have kept on turning up and kept on keeping on uh and and up and and i i hope with a, a safe space being led to a safe space to consider a bit this stuff mm. might find a place of reflection that is safe enough to to find how to let the things that are going to die die and celebrate them celebrate that they had their heyday those things and those ways of being one of the other things i i ask about and i do this mindfully is that uh when i started to be conscious of this my parents were younger than i am now mm. And many of the people I'm working with are my parents' generation, the lay leaders we're working with. Now that's a reality I name because I think it is important. Mm. It's mm. a huge investment, isn't it? Yeah, and it, and, it, it, and we're talking, you know, 35, 40 of my 50 odd years, those people have been plugging away and the ones who are still there are invested. <laughs> so, so. Another dynamic that occurs in all of this, which is something the NCLS suggested last year, is uh, to uh, a group with the Ministry and Mission Commission of the General Synod, they highlighted that the, the proportion of people in different churches have changed such that um there are you know people that uh, that are moving into churches but they're moving into the 
um, what some call the free church movement, what others call the Pentecostal charismatic movement or, um, you know, the independent church movement, however you describe it, so that there are um, the, the balance of representation such is that the Pentecostal charismatic churches now um, are about on equal play with uh, the Anglicans in terms of the influence, in terms of people's lives, a number of people that are involved across the country, more suburban than rural, um, but in quite a different structure to ours, you know, so that uh, there'll be, uh, many will be larger congregations than ours and, and fewer congregations. Mm -hmm. So that you know, we operate a very dispersed model um, to be in a regional and rural Australia in a variety of ways. Um, uh, so just changes that a, a little bit in terms of, you know, as Charlie, you're reflecting on how your parents' generation, how people came into churches. So some people are being becoming Christian and some absolutely are coming into our Anglican life. We can identify them each time we go to a congregation, we can see new people who weren't there before. But uh, uh, people who are embracing Christian life uh, sometimes are looking at churches other than ours um, to do that. And, um, you know, I've reflected a little bit over the years on uh, for a long time, we offered one church model. You know, we offered one way of engaging God and engaging in ministry, which was to come to a second order Holy Communion service on a Sunday with four hymns, uh, with a sung setting, uh, with robed clergy, doing particular things with fellowship afterwards. And we could go from place to place to actually recognize the style of sandwiches, the style of the coffee, the style of everything, because it actually was a comfort for us in our in our life and sustained us and nurtured us in the soul and in our relationships with one another. Uh, but what's actually occurred around us is people have gone, uh, yeah, that's good. That's um, good for your parents' age group. <laughs> um, but we are looking for something that's different. And those tensions in terms of how we embrace it, are, have I scared you, Charlie? <laughs> oh, I just, I'm just having... So this, I experience a schizophrenia around this. So I walk into a church hall and I can literally say I've done this from the northern to the southern end of the east coast of Australia. And I can, as you said that, I could see what you were talking about. The kind of hospitality that is typical Anglican culture in Australia. Genuinely offered, always Genuinely wanting offered. someone else to be present. So on the one hand, it fills me with affection, gratitude, nostalgia. And on another hand, it fills me with a kind of, and I don't know what the right word is because any word I put there is going to be too loaded. Um, but a sense that I guess there's a, la a very strong contrast between that expression of hospitality and going and spending $10 on coffee and cake in any of the cafes that are beginning to reopen now. I suppose that's what I'm trying to say really gently because I really, I want to say the affection and the gratitude because that, that culture gave me a space to grow into an owned Christian faith. Absolutely. Each of the three of us are here in this conversation out of a church that did that. And actually, when we're in certain spaces, uh, when all much younger than we are now, I said, uh, yeah, experiment with us, be with us, be part of us, gave us uh, leadership opportunities, um, um, held us back when we were a bit, a bit excitable. Um, that might be my story. <laughs> um, and the different pieces that are around um, some of that. But that, uh, that sort of church actually did do, do some of that. And I, I was listening to a podcast uh, today, or an audio book today, of someone talking about that there are generations who are encountering liturgy and lectionary and ascetic who find something in that which isn't present in other movements. And some of those other movements are trying to capture it, but also it is a strength place, a place for us um, when we do offer it. So the um, Anglican encounter with the divine can actually be, you know, such a rich, rich place. So we, we do have a gift to offer. I think some of the grief is it's actually all got a little bit harder to offer than it once did too. You know, we have to pay more to heat the hall. 
we have to have a different sort of coffee. Um, you have to have the food handling rules that have covered off everything in the way that we do it. Now we have to socially distance and have hand hygiene and all of, all of the rest. Um, and people are trying to do all of that. And there's a grief about the sustainability of that. Yet there's a heart's desire to actually go, this is something that's made me who I am. How can I give it to you so that you can become who God wants you to be? Is that what is that where you are heading? Or I know that was a long yeah yeah it's a what I, what i'm saying is that that was a vessel a cultural expression of very sincere faithfulness that was about being hospitable and reaching out to people mm. uh and 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 i still see it expressed in church halls at repasts after funerals um mm. uh, uh and people in those moments accept that hospitality as the gift it's intended to be. Just there's this whole raft of stuff here that fills me up with things I need to get out somehow in conversation with these folks to say, you know, so much of this has been so good. So what would we name as some of the essentials in terms of um, uh, Anglican life um, about what it is we're trying trying to do. So I've used for two years the term flourishing because my idea is that anyone who's associated with any of our churches or activities um, uh, goes away enhanced, graced, blessed um, as a result of that, that process. And I don't use flourishing in a uh, soft syrupy sort of way because sometimes to flourish, you actually have to be pruned and um, uh, guided a bit in order that you can actually do the flourishing. But it really is about a sense of growth. And another piece that I'm committed to is the idea that across the geography that we've been given, we, we are a culture that says that we're meant to be present uh, in all the places across the diocese in some way or form that, you know, um, you know, the idea I, I think is that, you know, we've got communities um, that live healthy ways, vibrant ways, encouraging ways that others can come into and flourish as they become part of those. Um, what I talked about two years ago and we've talked about through that time as the healthy church practices, if every church is actually doing some of that. Um, there are places that people go, there's a bit of something in there for me. Um, I'm just wondering what are some of the other essentials, you know, in terms of when we're working with these parishes at the moment, we're actually inviting them to let go of some things in order that they can embrace something else. Um, and we're actually saying you've borne the heat of the day and you've carried all these costs. Now, actually, to do this further, uh, let's say, say we're looking at three parishes working together with, say, four buildings. We're actually saying, um we know it's hard and we know it's demanding but would you be would you be able to do that work of representing the kingdom of god and flourishing by letting go of this ownership of this local place that is yours to come together in a new and different way um and i don't know i i experienced some people look at me and go um you haven't convinced me yet bishop so so in the in this epoch of a couple of years where that flourishing has been the dominant um, image to catch things, in the coastal episcopate, two parishes with two centres have done the work to come to the place of accepting and grieving that maintaining two buildings um, reasonably close together, buildings in both cases, really different in some detail, but both re they've said the burden of sustaining both these buildings has become intolerable and impossible for us. Mm. And both those parishes in distinct ways have courageously and to my surprise with very little 
attrition. Mm. Combine those two congregations into one. In one case, the weaker congregation accepted the stronger congregation into its building because the stronger congregation came to the place of going, this building which we can no longer repair also no longer serves us. And leaders came to a place where they both grieved that but named its reality. In the other place, the strength of the congregations was closer. But the historically slightly younger congregation came to a place of assurance that the other congregation would allow them to keep their distinct character and that they would rearrange their resource between them so that different characters of being Christian community could be authentically expressed in the same space. Now, both those projects are still underway, hmm. but both those projects are in what I would call epochs of growth. In spite of them having had very significant amputations to the, or really it's, it's a rearrangement. It's a radical rearrangement of their and reassignation of their resources. And if I could add a couple of bits, um, both of those parishes by making those choices have contributed substantially to the journey and mission of redress in the diocese. Very much so. And there's been a contribution of, from both of them towards a mission and ministry trust where there's ministry away from them in other places so that it's part of a broader set of pictures. The, the, the tension place that we have if it and is that for both those congregations, um, and you know, Bishop Sonia could talk about some in her own area as well that are doing the same work, is that we're only in sort of chapter one of the story and what we can't tell yet is a story of, and as a result of this, this is how we've then been able to do um, flourishing perhaps by more people coming to church or flourishing by new ministries being created or flourishing um, uh, by new or new and different activities. Because in each of the ones, we're only partway through the early stages of the rearrangement in order to do the next bit. Um, yeah. But there's been a there's been a, a, a lifting in that that space, hasn't there? And, and there's been a conscious ownership in the two parishes I was discussing that a willingness about the very significant contribution towards redress that's mm -hmm. come out of that. Mm. But that 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 was a journey for both those groups, but they came to a place of ownership first and gratitude for the ownership second which has been expressed mm. we've been seen it expressed and 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 also the mission and ministry trust uh and if i'm really honest that part i think was the harder journey it was easier to say oh yes we need to be part of the redress story but then there's, there's been a, a moment of imagination about really we are part of a wider family of congregations and parish organisations and, 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 and that is an investment in possibilities as yet unseen and that encourages me. If I go back to the graph or the diagram we had before, there's something of either redevelopment or rebirthing occurring in both of those places. And I think of um, the parish in the uh, inland Episcopate that dissolved, um, actually moved congregations in, in different, into different parishes. And so effectively three parishes have changed quite dramatically as a result of, of that journey. Um, there's, there's also in that story, a sense of redevelopment and rebirthing. So, 
as we think of that diagram, those are fairly radical actions that have been engaged by in each of those places. And some of the other ones we've been talking about yet uh, are perhaps yet to come to the place of embracing the need for as radical or brave or as courageous a set of decisions um, for no, no fault of their, their own. It's just in a sense, it's around, are they ready to see the complexity what's in, what in front of them? And the brave step sometimes feels harder than the staying still, doesn't it? It's a bit like almost, um, oh, yeah. it's a new... flight, fright or freeze, it's actually easier to, it almost, we've got them frozen, haven't we? So that parish that you mentioned, they did that hard work. Um, and I think that there's something about the leadership they had, there's something about their prayerfulness and faithfulness. Mm. But when we got to the, the point of actually saying, um, this is the final step, they actually started to tell stories of ministry mm. and about realising that the building wasn't everything, that there was something more important than the building, although the building had become the repository of some valuable stories in their life. Um, and I don't think they could have come to that point until they'd made that journey. Mm. Um, so that was a real insight because I think what... Well, like you say, don't say we never do change as Anglicans because we do it all the time. And look at the change we've done this time. We don't notice we're doing it unless there's a milestone like that one where the people say, mm -hmm. actually, what a blessing. We're talking about ministry and we are excited to be engaged in ministry, not just trying to raise enough money to keep our buildings open. Mm -hmm. And I think as someone in a different parish, when they were talking about closure of centres or not, um, and she said... Well, my, when my centre closed, it was the greatest relief to me. I was sad, but I was no longer responsible for keeping that building open and maintained and cleaned and getting people to church on Sunday. And I could go to church and worship without worrying. Mm. Mm. Yes. Well... Yeah. What I'm hearing in us all as we have this conversation is that we have in mind the sacredness of the journeys of people and that this is the depths of their lives held before mm -hmm. God that we're working with here. Mm -hmm. And it is to be taken very seriously as we ask people to examine uh, parts of ways of being people and being people in community that are truly vulnerable because people have invested all that they are in it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, it's been very helpful to me for us to s discuss this because uh, strangely the naming of that vulnerability gives a courage in the space to because you because it's so important to work faithfully to do it well and, and and to try to work with people so that we can catch each other in moments when we're not doing it as well and and return to doing it well so that we can make good decisions and move rather than just be stuck because we know it's too important to risk it in one sense and get to the place where it's so important we must risk it and and if i can add to that i don't want people listening to this and to the conversation we've just had going one size fits all so no. now this is what they're no. going to order everywhere because we're working really hard i'm working with some parishes you both are to say what is the best local solution here mm. um, so that we have a sustainable future for you um, not just to say okay we're coming there and this is what we're doing absolutely everywhere. We might learn some things from each other. There might be some stuff that works in one place that we take to another and go, okay, we've learned something new here. Um, but I don't want people to hear that this is just a steamroller coming through. I think that's really essential because if I think about some of the major change projects with parishes that have gone on in the last four years, um, each of them has been quite different 
in terms of what's what's in what's in place and each have involved a toing and froing of conversation and a recalibrating of um, what needs to happen and uh, they've often been a, a cul-de-sac that we've gone down for a while which we didn't know was a cul-de-sac where we've actually had to explore something because it's there and needed to be discussed and to go actually it's not helpful and come back out but the permission to go into that journey and uh, that we gave each other was an essential because we actually had to, we could spend time going we needed to think about that um and, and come out and other times where we've gone down a, a road we've actually kept on going down the road because it's emerged to be the right road um so that's absolutely right as you were both speaking i was also trying to reflect on the fact that we often move back into the structure the pragmatics, the building, the boundaries and the governance, because they're the practical manifestations of um, the project we're trying to engage in. We're, but what's driving the three of us and the parishes that we've worked with in this way and continue to work with is what does the kingdom of God require of us and how are we creating communities who are the servants messengers and ambassadors of god's reign you know so now how do we go about serving god's reign in this place how do we become communities that proclaim in word and sacraments god's grace and how do we sort of um bear witness to that god, to god's grace in those in those places um and so that's the broader meta story life-giving story that we have but in our anglican way we sometimes actually have to go back into some of the practical detail to to um, go well this is what it will, will look like and it's a strange dance isn't it because we have to do both at the same time and our different people and our different personalities need us to land in different places so one person will say what's your vision and another person will go who's going to pay for it and we need the scaffolding don't we like we, we need the framework mm. um, but it's how we live within it as the people of God you know, and um, we studied Acts through Lent. Acts is full of the stories of the people of God trying things. Mm. You know, and, and breaking so many different boundaries in that journey and going, you know, we thought God had this. No, you can eat all the food. No, yeah. you don't actually have to treat new converts this way. Bang, bang, bang. Well, the lesson in the early church, you know, uh, it's not I who gave you the growth. What is Paul? What is Apollos? It is mm. God who gives the growth. We're just tending the garden. And I love the way in Acts the, the focus moves from uh, from here's a person or a one-to-one -one interpersonal encounter and then opens out to a big story of the community as a whole or even the yeah. panoramic view of the church as it moves from Jerusalem, you know, towards Rome, across the Mediterranean. Uh, it, it's It's... So it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful way of moving between the perspective of each person's journey with God. You know, mm -hmm. one minute Paul's there recovering from encountering his Lord for the first time, uh, and and then and then he's thinking big again. And 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 the way that story is told in Acts helps to keep doing this moving between holding each person sacred but knowing that each person is a member of the body and that's what i think you're flourishing by grace uh, is, is a wonderful image in in that it is the abundance of the life of the kingdom which gives to each of us and all of us the promise that the future is god's yeah. and acts so also doesn't it? it it tells us that the community of disciples actually had to robustly wrestle with one another to discern the mind of Christ and what they're going to do. You know, so we see Paul and Barnabas have to come back and, and have a conversation with the council of the elders and go, what are we going to do here? And, and, and trying to discern the right way around some tricky pieces. And the tone of that writing goes, this wasn't, a, a, you know, sort of a, a mild afternoon conversation over a nice gin and tonic. This was a robust wrestling with the things of deep heart. And the other part is that the broader community around um, could be antagonistic or misunderstand what's occurring or completely ambivalent. 
Mm. Um, and uh, but that still required the people of God to respond to the Spirit of God to try and uh, enact in the best way possible what they think they should do. Um, and Acts also has got some pretty tough judgment in there at times for those who um, uh, don't engage properly. Um, in, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so it, it's a great book because, yeah, we started in Lent and then some of our readings in, in the Easter season take us back there and get us to reflect on, on the Christian community. And in just over a week's time, um, well, in a week's time when people are watching this, um, we're at Pentecost, that celebration of what uh, God will do to animate the people of God for the ministry and mission to which they're called. There's a beautiful oh. piece the other week, um, uh, the, the bishop that uh, uh, we were talking with from Canada reminded us that, um, that God gives to the church the gifts that they need for the mission to which they're called, but that not all the gifts reside in any one particular congregation or parish that there is a great interdependence that we're called to, which is beyond any one local community for the fullness of our response to the fullness of what God has given to us. Um, and uh, I like the way that he was trying in his way, in his place, um, echoing some of the things we've done in this diocese in various ways, and also then speaking into it from a different culture and context to go, we've got to keep at this, that it's about collaboration, it's about mutuality, it's about interdependence. Um, it's about taking risks. It's about trust. You know, some of those messages that came through in this sense of we can be in this together in, in quite vibrant ways. Okay. The other thing I was thinking as I listened to Charlie and listened to you too was, you know, the early church went out driven by the spirit. They didn't wake up one day and go, oh, let's go and plant a church. They were driven by the spirit. And mm. the question for us is where is the spirit driving us today? Mm. And are we listening? Mm. Or how are we listening? And that has, to, yeah, yeah, the, and and that has to be discerned in every age by the church and in the context of that church. You know, mm -hmm. so as a diocese, we, we we're we're the expression of the Anglican Church in this region. So, what is the Spirit saying to us as the collective of fifty-nine parishes, Anglican care, Samaritans, our four schools? the work of the diocesan office, the work of those who journey with us but don't necessarily want to be fully part of us. What's the Spirit saying to that broad collective here and now? Um, and, you know, to discern that and courageously pursue that. And I think there are some elements that we know around that in terms of things like a celebration of the giftedness that God gives to women and to men, the celebration of the giftedness that God gives to people of, of a variety of ways of living their life. I think those are two of the pieces that we go that are really important. A celebration of the story that we've had from the past, but also a desire to embrace newness and new things, you know, um, in, a, in a way that shapes us as who, who we are. We've been using the canticle from St. Ansem. Jesus, as a mother, you gather your people to you. You are gentle with us as a mother with her children. Often you weep over our sins and our pride. Tenderly you draw us from hatred and judgment. You comfort us in sorrow and bind up our wounds. In sickness you nurse us, and with pure milk you feed us. Jesus, by your dying we are born to new life. By your anguish and labour we come forth in joy. Despair turns to hope through your sweet goodness. Through your gentleness we find comfort in fear. Your warmth gives life to the dead. Your touch makes sinners righteous. Lord Jesus, in your mercy, heal us. In your love and tenderness, remake us. In your compassion, bring grace and forgiveness. 
for the beauty of heaven may your love prepare us. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, Christ have mercy. mercy. Lord, have mercy. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God of majesty, you led the Messiah through suffering into risen life and took him up into the glory of heaven. Clothe us with the power promised from on high and send us forth to the ends of the earth as heralds of repentance and witnesses of Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, who lives with you now and always in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God the Father, your will for all people is health and salvation. Praise and thank you, O Lord. God the Son, you came that we might have life and might have it more abundantly. We praise you and thank you, O Lord. God the Holy Spirit, you make our bodies the temple of your presence. We praise you and we thank you, O Lord. Holy Trinity, one God, in you we live and move and have our being. We praise you and thank you, O Lord. Comfort all in these days who grieve family, friends and colleagues. That they may have courage and strength to meet the days ahead. Pour out your healing love on all who are sick, injured or disabled. That they may be made whole. Grant knowledge of your will to all who seek your guidance. And a sense of your presence to all those afraid, anxious or overwhelmed. Give peace, courage and hope to all who suffer in body, mind or spirit. Hear us, O Lord of life. Bless physicians, nurses and all who minister to the sick and suffering. Keep them safe and healthy and sustain them in wisdom, skill, sympathy and patience. Grant to all political leaders the spirit of wisdom, charity and justice that with steadfast purpose they may faithfully serve in their offices to promote the well-being of all people. Give perseverance and creativity to researchers, policy makers and leaders, including all who lead and govern in our diocesan life. That they may continue to respond faithfully and well through the course of this pandemic. Be with teachers, students and parents as schools return full-time to face-to-face. -face. That all may grow in safety and flourish in their learning. O Lord our God, hear the prayers of your people. You are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, you have conquered death, through your dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and open to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant us by your grace to set our mind on things above, so that by your continual help our whole life may be transformed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, in everlasting glory. Amen. Christ is risen, alleluia, alleluia. He is, he is risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. 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 The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.